but I think that today's colleges and universities were created for a set of students that is in the minority. And then in turn taken all that cash and wasted it. Welcome everybody. I'm Keith Clary from Copley Retention. Before we get started, if I could ask you to uh, put your cell phones on mute, that would be great. And I am fortunate enough to be here with two people that I like a lot. Doug uh, and Sarah Goldick Robb from the University of Wisconsin Department of Education and the founder and director of the Hope Grant. Mark Cuban, who is a uh, education investor in Frank U, Pack Back Book, Degree, as well as in our company, Copy Retention, as well as most of us know him as Billy, an American entrepreneur. <laughs> so, really, um, both Mark and Sarah have very similar beliefs in the area of accessibility and the area of the cost of. of um, of, of higher education. So my first question to you is, how can we make college more affordable? Sure. Um, you put a limit on the amount of debt that the government will guarantee. You cut off the the the, fl the flow of money to schools, and they'll have no choice but to lower their costs and to lower um, what they charge. Simple. Well, <laughs> so, I think that's, that's, I think we actually agree on that part. I'll complicate it just a tiny bit more, which is that I think that today's colleges and universities were created for a set of students that is in the minority today, right? So it was built for the kind of student that gets to go to college full time, just focuses on school, has mom and dad to pay for it. Um, maybe works part-time waiting tables, which makes enough money to cover the living costs, etc. And that isn't today's college student at all. Today's college student is, is what we call non-traditional, which I think is a ridiculous word because it is the new traditional. They're juggling a lot. They have a lot to do. And the fact of the matter is that we're asking them to give up far too much of their income to pay for college. And, you know, Mark's right that essentially the government has facilitated the colleges and universities continuing to raise those prices every year because they can get a steady flow of income. Uh, in the private sector, that's what we're seeing happen. They just keep pricing it higher and more loans come in. In the public sector, however, I would argue that we don't see the loans causing this problem. We see the disinvestment of state government causing this problem. Yeah, but they go hand in hand, right? Because as if you have easy money, it's just like housing prices. Right, easy money forces up the price of housing, which means the price of college goes up in this particular case, which means that you force the hand of those who can't get access to the loans, mm -hmm. right, and that puts them in the position that you defined. No, I think that's right. I just think the Thank middle, you. the middle actor in the in the public sector is the state who's saying, hey, the money's there. Why don't we just pass the buck on to the families and they can take the loan? Yeah, but the money's not there, right? Just right. simply because the price of the school has gone up so much. Right. If you if you dial back the cost or the the cost of an education, the cost for a tuition credit back 15 years, yeah. all of a sudden what the states provide is enough. That's right? true. Right. What all of a sudden the non-traditional student who now becomes the typical student, right, isn't in the same position. They can borrow, which means they can go to the school one of the schools of their choice, which means they can survive with a part-time job working at McDonald's or waiting tables or wherever. It's just that we've created a bubble, no different than the real estate bubble. And the colleges, because it's so easy, it's been so easy for them to just keep riding that bubble, have then in turn taken all that cash and wasted it on infrastructure and administrators. Completely agree upon it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on faculty salaries, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you, you, talk, you talk about the today's college student, and you know, with more and more students as first generation students, returning students, uh, students with lower uh, income backgrounds, uh, there is also this kind of cost constraint, and technology has been coming in and looking to play a role. You know, how, how, how big of a role do you see technology playing in, the, in kind of where education is heading? 
You go first this time. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, I think, I mean, I think it's really good how you just laid out who this student is. And when you're thinking about that student in particular, I do think it is very unlikely that we will be successful in completely replacing human interaction. Um, because these are folks who haven't really had a positive educational experience in the past for a, a large part. And so they want to have some human contact. They need to have a positive touch. The question is, can any form of technology deliver that? Right? And can it help, can it help to um, enhance the offerings of the person who is interacting with them? So I think that's, you know, for example, what you guys are doing, where you're actually making the advisor or the tutor more effective through the use of technology. That's promising or when you're helping students to come together in other ways around their academic performance, that's promising. The idea that a student, though, who's a first-generation student is simply going to be advised only from a distance and never interact with an instructor and do well in school, I think that's unlikely. Yeah. Got a couple points. One, there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all education. Everybody learns differently. And the beauty of technology is for those who are self-directed, then we can allow them to accelerate their programs. We can allow them to move faster. We can allow them to work at their own speed and expand the resources they have access to via technology. That's a beautiful thing. Um, we also can take some of the things that are blocking and tackling that allow us to evaluate students to see exactly where they are and provide the, the tools that they need either to get to um, you know, a basic level or to get them where that university needs them to be in order to provide, um, in order to take advantage of the tool of the education um, at the school, whatever programs they choose, whatever classes they choose. And then we have like Hopley and we have other systems that manage that whole process. And I think the, the upside is that creating these programs, the cost to develop, the cost to enable, the cost to support has dropped dramatically since versus five years ago, 10 years ago. So that is more, it's more available to higher education or K-12. But the problem is the non invented here syndrome, right? Because I think part of the arrogance of particularly higher education is that if it's not mine, it's not good. And if it's not my brand, if it's not my name assigned to it, it's not good. And I think that is going to create a lot of ongoing problems, not just for students, but just operationally. I, you know, we were talking about this before. To me, higher education, with the exception of those schools who have such huge endowments that they can pay for any of their students to come to school, right? Put them aside. But with that exception, um, it's very analogous to the newspaper industry. You know, we're, yeah, we're Rosebud, right? We're everything. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're dominant. We're your source of news for everything you do in your classroom, at home, everything. Where do you come to to get information? And then all of a sudden they lose classified ads. They were disrupted and all of a sudden that changed. All of a sudden they looked at all those printing presses and all those big buildings that they owned and they were boat anchors. And they got delivered probably worse than everybody else. They had done all, the, all these acquisition sprees. They had borrowed money to do them and they were stuck. Well, where newspapers relied on debt to go out and buy and build buildings and acquire each other, schools of, you know, like we said earlier, we were, uh, um, looked at the guarantees and, and of student loans. And as they get delevered, and they will, then it's going to be an enormous implosion. And technology, I think they're going to turn far more quickly out of desperation to use technology. And so I think that's a long about, um, roundabout way of saying the role of technology will expand dramatically in universities because their desperation will lead them to technology. I'm going to stay on technology for, for one more um, question and then we'll move back. The, um, tell me if you agree or disagree with this. The cell phone, the smartphone, will become the digital backpack of the future. It already is. <laughs> yeah, it already is. Whether it's a tablet or, or a cell phone, mobile devices. And I mean, look, the, your cell phone. Um, even if you have a shitty ass phone, <laughs> it's more powerful than you know, many computers, mainframe computers were 10, 15 years ago. Um, it's more powerful than the, the Pentium 90s we were using to stream video, you know, in, in the late 90s that we had to stack left and right. You have access to the entire world, and you know the challenge of 
cell phones or smartphones is that right now 89% of access to the web, access to the internet via cell phones is through apps. The problem is that Google and Apple control the on-ramp to all apps, all, all, the on-ramp to um, apps, which is a huge problem. Now, could it be a problem for education? That remains to be seen, but it's something that I think is something that all of us, whether in the education business, the tech, ed tech business, or any business, have to be you know, very aware of. I think the other problem that you have is that we would both say yes, but the majority of my colleagues in higher education, the faculty, would say no. That there's no way that that's going to happen. They don't know that it already has happened, and they've resisted it. I have to say, I used to believe it was because they really didn't want to do it. I have, to, I, I have to tell you, I think a lot of them were just genuinely scared. Of course. You know, I mean, when I arrived at the University of Wisconsin in 2004 at a faculty meeting, they taught us how to print double-sided. <laughs> okay. I'm not I'm kidding. still teaching that class. I'm not kidding, right? I mean, so one of the problems we have is that you bring a lot of technology to our door and we are not taught how to use it. We're also not given professional development opportunities or time to learn how to use it, right? So what you have when you're faced with these new things and you're, you know, you've been doing the same thing over and over for years is you're scared. So, you know, you have students in the classroom, I think, who would be ready to access material in that way, who are sitting there wondering why you're not, and what you have is somebody who just has no idea how to do and it. That's, so, and that's why it's great for disruption. I'll, I'll, I'll freak, out, freak, freak people out even more. Why did Facebook buy WhatsApp? So it can run on less powerful phones. So now if you're into the third world where the phones may be hand-me-down, they may not even truly be um, smartphones, but they're capable of running Facebook, you don't think education is going to happen over those connections? You don't think people are going to ask to be educated, try to be educated, and use just, you know, a Motorola, the equivalent of a Motorola flip phone from 2004 when you're learning double side printed? You know, yeah, of course. Right. And so if you think that your world hasn't been disrupted, right. that's why I like to be in this business because, you know, when you see people who want, haven't figured out that they're out of business yet, <laughs> 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 I had overheard the two of you talking earlier um, about choosing college and how to go about choosing the college. And I know you have some strong feelings on that both of you. And so I just wanted to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I think I'd like to write a, some, some kind of new version. I think too many people are using the Princeton Review in terms of you know how to, how to pick colleges today or some kind of online version of that. And they're not focused on what's the most important thing, which is what's affordable for you. And I don't think that they really know how to ask questions about what's going to be affordable. So, for example, they're looking at uh, what's the financial aid offer. You know, so a lot of people know how to look at that financial aid offer, but what they don't know is that the institutions have incentives to give you a specific offer for your first year that's going to change by your second year. Right? They're trying to get you in the door, and then they pull the bait and switch. Right? You also don't know, and I don't hear parents walking around the campuses asking questions like, how much is my student's support, their academic support, and priority of this institution? Right? How much of the money is going to the coach versus the professor? How much of the time All that's publicly spend? available, but it doesn't change the fact that it's ridiculous. I don't think it's that publicly available for the private schools. Oh, it's I know where to find it for my public institution, but I think this stuff is hidden from parents and families. And so they're given all these other markers, like these fancy buildings that they're supposed to use to judge quality, when in fact, all that is is how much they're not spending on your student. I got an email from a kid probably two days ago. He goes, Mark, I, I need your advice on which, where, where to go to school. He goes, I've narrowed it down to two. One was Hofstra and the other one Rutgers. And he said, where, where, what do you think? Which is a better school? I said, which is cheaper? And he emails me back, Hofstra, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally, and it breaks my heart, um, I've had people ask me the same type of question about Indiana University, where I went to school. And the answer is, what's the cheapest one? Why? Because I know just from interviewing, I can't even count how many people for jobs, my own experiences, talking to people, talking to parents, that the one certainty about an 18-year-old is that they're clueless. <laughs> the second certainty about 22-year-olds they're still clueless. <laughs> and trying to make a decision that's going to leave you hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt is ridiculous. And so, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of external things that might say, you know, well, my family's gone here, whatever the case may be, um, this is a better party school, this is whatever. 
um, there aren't a lot of some, I, I'm a big believer you go to college to learn how to learn and then when you graduate instead of paying to learn how to learn you get a job where you get paid to learn how to learn you get paid to learn and then whether you stay at one job or skip around to different jobs you're continuing to get paid to learn you you get continuing to get paid to learn until you figure out what you want to be if you grow up um, and so that to me is the progression and the concept of brand you know I think the problem that kids go through is they associate the brand of the university with themselves they, they it's like an affinity brand it's like about getting a Mavericks credit card if I use my Mavericks credit card hey I must be you know I'm, I'm showing you know who I am I'm, I'm defining who I am and so if I go to the Harvard of the whatever the Harvard of the Southwest the East the North the South then I must be smart and everybody will think I'm smart that probably worked five years ago and earlier and it works some today but that's going to go away Right. Unless you actually go to Harvard or some school that is, you know, has the endowment to pay for you to get through there, you're going to realize very quickly that if you went to school A and you left school A with $120,000 in debt with just a regular degree, you were an idiot. And not only were you an idiot, the school was horrible and just as bad and just as misleading for the reasons Sarah just mentioned. And so their brand, brand is going to suffer dramatically. And that's why you know, with Ronku, we're looking at outcome-based um, education and making choices based off of outcome. To me, you're going to see the brands of universities deteriorate quickly and dramatically because of the positions they're putting their kids in. If you can't educate a kid without putting them so far in debt, their life is, is marginalized, you don't think you should be you should get whacked for that? I have a question. I have a question as an, as an employer, right? And this is what we don't know in education. So NYU is one of those schools that puts an enormous number of people in debt and also takes an enormous amount of money from the federal government, right, to put people in debt. Are you telling me that employers are going to start rejecting those NYU applicants? At some point, you're just saying, are you kidding me? I mean, look, I, it's, I have no problem asking a, an applicant, how much money do you owe? You know, because, you know, it, it, your living conditions <laughs> and how you live through life impacts how you live, what kind of car did you drive, right? Did you, you know, take, you know, did you buy a house? You know, what, what are your expectations? Where are you at? And look, it's not necessarily bad from an employer's perspective that they have a lot of debt because you're stuck, right? It's going to be a lot harder for you to switch jobs, right? It's like having good insurance. I hate my job, but... <laughs> um, you know, but at the same time, I'm going to look at you and go, okay, you're a kid. But as these things evolve and we become smarter about outcome-based education, that's going to revert back to you. It's going to be the equivalent of putting a drunk picture on Facebook. You know, here's my drunk picture. I was trashed at my high school prom. Oh, I was trashed when I made a decision to go to this school and take on $100,000 a day, right? I just, I just see it having enormous consequences um, that we all have to pay attention to. I mean, if, if in business, right? If, like, I've done interviews where I said, you're an idiot if you take out a loan to start a business. Because the bank wants paid, no matter what. And they work to their schedule, not yours. Wait, this is, no, this is the business of you. And again, you get a pass because you're 18. The university doesn't get a pass for putting you in that position. I totally agree. I always look at people who came from community colleges in a very special way because, first of all, if they came out of a community college and they got somewhere with a four-year degree or of any kind, they're survivors to begin with. But also, they made a really smart economic decision. Do you really think that employers are going to start to value those credentials? Yes. Look, there was an article by Google uh, about Google. They were talking about hiring. I think it was in the New York Times yes. where they were saying, you know what? The guy, the guy who hires, what, 100 people a day? He was saying, you know, I personally would like people to go to college, but if you, get, if you have what I need, I'm more than happy to hire you. You know, I'm more than happy to do the same thing. I've, I've invested money in kids that, you know, 19, 18, 20, don't have degrees yet. Um, there's a Shark Tank deal. Lonnie, um, who had, um, Lainey, I was, she gets mad at me. Um, she has a company, um, Simple Sugars, and she makes scrubs. She came on Shark Tank, she was 19, $40,000 in business. Now, she's, she'll do $3 million this year. She's killing it. Never went to college. Who cares? I don't, not a problem. The goal is obviously to get the students through college, to make them contributing adults, the ability to support a family. 
what's the one thing or a one thing that you think could help in kind of achieving that goal? Because obviously it's a big challenge. I'm sorry, maybe you might want to. Right, well, it is a huge challenge, and I think a lot of people don't really realize it's a big part of why this country is not getting towards where its goals right now, because we've pushed a lot of people to go to college, and yet you have places where, frankly, one in ten are finishing what they started. One in ten, oh yeah, I can give you a list. <laughs> and it's pretty incredible. It's, it's actually oftentimes the case that people don't even, yeah, they don't know it. It's in, that, in your local paper that I can give you five colleges in Chicago right now where that's the case. I can give you several in Wisconsin. I can give you plenty in Pennsylvania. We don't talk about it, and it's mainly because I think that we pin it on the student. Mostly we for say, profits? Or no, they're you know? for profit, they're public, they're private, they're all over the place. We have some really dismal completion rates, and the problem is that the tendency is to say, to throw up our hands and say, well, that was somebody who wasn't supposed to go to college. That was, that was we made a mistake, right? That was, we're not doing our job gatekeeping, right? The high school should have told them not to go. My attitude is, frankly, we, we took them, we accepted them, it's our responsibility now, and we have to do what we can with them. And what's often missing is any kind of outcomes-based assessment of what we have to do to support them and what works when we're supporting them, I and then a full-on revision. I right? can't even imagine taking somebody's money and saying, nah, 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 that was your fault because your high school guidance counselor didn't help you out. That's ridiculous. I mean, it, it's, it's scary to think. I mean, shame on us for not bringing them to the forefront and you know, throwing them under the bus publicly. Um, that's, that's just sad. That's just sad in every shape and form. So what do you think, Mom? What do you think would be? Well, I mean, obviously, I invested in Copley for, for that very reason, that staying in school is difficult. And the tools that are required, particularly as education changes, that it's not, you know, Kids in college today aren't educated the way they were when I went to school. We went to school. And so because of the evolution, you need systems and, and, and procedures in place that give you the tools to evolve, right? So what work might work for one school or one set of students or one class of students, it may be sit down face to face. It may be because they're working and they can't get there. You know, if you're working all the time, you're not going to be able to go sit with a guidance counselor or advisor. You're not even going to be able to Skype. So having the tools that track and, and support students and let faculty and the university know exactly what's going on is a new step in the right direction and I, and I think vital and critical. Um, and universities have got to be aware of that and hopefully, look, when the money starts to disappear and they start getting desperate, they start turning to retention tools in order to, to justify their existence and to say what good things they're doing. So I think you guys are in the right space there because I think that's critical. Well, thank you, um, both of you, for coming up and having questions. Do you want to take some questions? Uh, okay. Take a okay. <laughs> Except from these two. No questions for you. What do you mean? Okay, well, no questions. There you go. What kinds of um, non cognitive intervention have you thought about um, uh, providing? Uh, Paul Tuff wrote a book a couple of years ago, and you're probably familiar with it. It talks about things like grit and stick to itiveness and ability to fail and get up are all um, maybe more important than early cognitive um, and, and later cognitive intervention? Um, that's a great question. I, I have to say personally, having read the research on grit and having looked at the issue of grit in higher education, I'm not that convinced, frankly, that the issue that the students are facing today is a lack of intuitiveness. They've done a lot of that. Um, and we're seeing more and more students who've come out of really tough backgrounds who actually are in college. The problem is that they don't actually know people who do college and do it well in their life, so they don't see themselves as successful in college. So if they, if it's, it's kind of similar to what we see with women in math. If you ask a woman, can you see yourself as being good at math, they're far less likely to say yes. Okay, so their self-concept does not involve seeing themselves as being good at it. There are interventions that have been done where essentially you do, it's kind of like an affirmation, if, for those of you who are you know, aware of that. <laughs> and this seems to work. They actually do a fairly short thing. There's some good research out of Stanford. You do a fairly short thing in the first year of college that has lasting effects over four years through graduation. And they're more likely, for example, to take harder math classes and those sorts of things. But I think it's part of seeing yourself as fitting in Right? And, and forming bonds to other people who look and talk like you and who are from where you're from. Those are the sorts of things that have to be attended to. And, you know, Copley's got this neat part that has this sort of social nature to it. Right? Depending on who the students connect to, that could be very positive. I mean, I can't speak to education in terms of group, but I can tell you what we do with the Mavericks. 
Um, when you come and you get drafted or you come to the team, we tell you exactly what's expected of you. Because not everybody has the same grit or stick to it. Um, we have a team psychologist who sits down and says to you, here's what we want and here's how we expect you to do it. Here's the program we expect you to follow. If you don't follow it, you need to talk to me and or I'm going to talk to you. And then we have um, a, a workout guy, I guess for lack of a better name, a player development person who knows what that program is, what the tools are that they need to develop. Do they need to develop a jump shot, better dribbling, better deep, whatever it is, and has a very specific program that they work on on, on a day-by-day -day basis. And because it's very Darwinian, you can't teach stick to it with this. Yeah, well, that's what she said. Um, <laughs> but you can measure it, right, by how they work and what they're able, able to accomplish. And so I, I think the same type of thing, not in all schools because of cost and, and you're not going to get that personal attention, but I think if you tell, people, tell students what's expected of them, I don't care if it's freshman English, I don't care if it's a freshman year, um, create milestones that you're able to measure, but you also actually track. And when they don't reach those milestones, deal with it and provide the consequences to it. You'll see who does have it, and you also give the people, give the opportunity to those who may have it and not know it, the opportunity to prove that they do have it. Beyond that, you know, I, I do also think that everybody's wired differently. And, you know, I've, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. My brothers are night and day different. Um, and I think we've all seen that type of experience. And so I don't know that you can teach it, but I know that you can understand it and recognize um, how that person is wired and try to do your best to put them in the positions to succeed. Yes. Um, what kind of interesting alternatives have you seen to higher education, like you know, General Assembly, Code School, gap year stuff, you know, Y Combinator, Techstars Accelerators? Like, if you had children, what kind of alternative experiences would you recommend to, to go into higher education and going into debt? Because you said which one's going to get you least in debt? Well, avoid it entirely. That's the least amount of debt. I think this is the big open space, and I mean, whoever cracks this one is, is going to do really well. I think there has to be something else for people between ages maybe 18 and 20 or 18 and 21. I wish there was somewhere else that they could go for a few years to learn how to get on their feet on their own in a structured environment. I think the trick here is we know that when we create these opportunities, people who have stuff get to go to Europe and try to do cool things. People who don't have any money go off and work and they don't find their way back to college. So there's a, I wrote a paper that's about the class gap and the gap here. Right? And that's a problem because that's going to create more inequality, right? Well, I don't think, personally, I don't think that the evidence indicates that's any good for us. So I think that, it, well, frankly, when we get them at 22, right, the ones who start older, or the vets who are coming in, right, or I get graduate students, boy, are they much more motivated. And they're also just ready to do their own laundry before they come in my classroom. I mean, you know, I mean, it's hard to master doing everything all at the same time. But also, more importantly, these are high-risk decisions especially with the money that's attached to these things right now. And it's, it really almost seems unethical, frankly, to shove everybody in the, the way that we are. I think employers will figure out how to um, fill that gap. There's so many jobs, particularly in technology, that are going unfilled. That's why the whole immigration issue is so big, that because they can't fill those jobs from traditional graduates or fill enough of them from traditional graduates, they're looking to the code academies and others to be able to provide them workers. And you know, I've worked with several different companies, my own companies. I don't care where they went to school if they can code. You know, I don't care if they went to school or where they went to school if they're smart. You know, I hired a kid just now. He sent me an email, sent me some samples of some apps he's written, and I said, "Okay, you can keep on going to school if you want, or I can hire you. But here's two thousand dollars a month. Keep on doing these projects for me." <laughs> just a kid who emailed me. I mean, so employers will take steps because they have to, and because there's such a gap between jobs and, well, there's so many empty jobs. And so I think they're going to drive, to Sarah's point, um, the need. Yes, I'll take one more. You, you tied into something that I'm interested in your thoughts and is right now we don't really have good mechanisms at the front end to tell both adult learners and traditional learners, if you will, where are the jobs going to be in five years? How are we communicating that? And then how are we, commun how are we better communicating those? What's Nobody, knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Then what they might be doing. Here's what I told Indiana University when they asked me. I told them their senior year, 
takes to I told them for senior year, Indiana needs to come up with new classes every single year. Every two years, every three years, every four years. Every year, there's a whole new series of electives so that, that are geared towards training their kids who are about to graduate in certain, um, certain majors for the needs, the current needs of employers. So if you want to learn Ruby on Rails, right? If Ruby on, if, you know, Best DB, there's so many other different um, technologies that are popping up every year. It should be the job of the university to go out and find the best teacher or one of the best teachers for those new features that you know your the, the time delta is only you know nine months away from the time the semester starts or from the time you start the process, let's say a year away. Okay, you're still not gonna be perfect, but you're gonna be a lot better suited. And that way, kids are gonna say, you know what? The hot, the new, the now, the things that, that corporations are telling Indiana or whatever university they need, we're training them. And we're training them. And it might be not just three hours, it might be six hours, it might be nine hours, whatever it takes, the equivalent of a code academy. You do that, and it starts getting easy. If you start expecting them to figure it out four years in advance, you get what you deserve. I think that's right. I just want to make sure that we don't train them for jobs when they're spending all that money for that four-year degree, that we don't train them for jobs that will only be there for a few years. Right? Well, you want I mean, to learn critical thinking. You learn critical thinking. I agree thinking with you. Right? So I want to see the emphasis on that, and that, I think, is what we haven't conquered. I mean, I don't even think that most of us know how to really teach, develop critical thinking skills. I think that a lot of us get people who have them. That's who's admitted, and then we sort of process them through it, right? We don't necessarily add value there. I think helping us to learn how to do that is really big. Assessing those things is really difficult. No multiple choice exam is gonna do that for us, right? So we do these essays, and I, I'm glad that we're coming up with some technology to help us to figure out how to deal with those essays, but overall, that stuff takes time. And that's what I always see, and you know, at least when I'm hiring, what my biggest concern is is that they can't think for themselves or they're not very analytic. That troubles me, and the other thing they lack is social skills. Right? And that is one concern I have. I love the technology that actually teaches you social skills, but I have interviewed community college students who say to me, I have problems with public speaking. So they sign up to take an online public speaking course, which they never actually interact with anyone, and they get credit, and that is a travesty. Right? So you know, it can be used in good ways, and it can be used in bad ways, and I think the trick is to figure out who's doing it well. Okay. All right, we have time for one more in the back. called degree for that very reason. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm working with major corporations because it's not only about what they get outside of work, um, but also the things they're trained on inside of work. And because companies don't want to have to go out, there, there's always a revolution in technology in every big company, right? Whatever's new, they have to deal with. And it, for a long time now, they've had to go out and hire new people, which is very difficult to do. They'd rather retain their existing people and retrain them or add them to their skill set. But if you don't know what they already know, it's very difficult to pick who to train and how to train them. And so products like Degree, which will allow organizations to inventory their existing employees, and when they train them, track all of that, and if they happen to also have external training or experience in something, give, have the company give them credit for it, I think that's critical. As far as going, you know, getting credit that applies to a degree, I mean, they, they're looking at stuff like that, but I'm so not a fan of accreditation. I think it's just become a phone anchor um, that these companies are the ultimate accreditation and or whatever it is you try to accomplish. It may not be you're into corporate. If you're an artist, create art. If you're a musician, create music. Whatever it may be, that's the ultimate accreditation. And I, I just think that companies like Degree would be the first step towards making those changes. I think the jury's out. I mean, the University of Wisconsin colleges are doing this right now and doing it at scale. Um, I, as a as a somebody who's an empiricist who likes to see data, I'm looking for that evaluation. 
I'm looking to see what we're going to get from it. Uh, will it bring in new people, right, that's intended to tap into a different market, right, including my governor who wants to finish his degree now. Will he actually finish it? Let's see. So you can right? be a governor without having a degree. So, you know, I mean, I really think that, I think that we need to see some evidence on that. Well, thank you both for that's taking fine. time to uh, bar open for a little bit and make go around so if you want to catch up and, and chat to Dr. Sarah and Mark they'll be here for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> 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 